Welcome back. Let's take this opportunity to review a game I just played. Uh, it's a close game, and uh, we'll take a look at it. So, my opponent and I, I think last played about a decade ago. It was an extremely complicated game where uh, I think I played the King's Indian, and I got my king cornered and through some miracle didn't get blown out in the opening. And so this game, in general, I was attempting to just play very conservatively and not mess up in the opening. And I was just a bit nervous because it's not every opponent. I mean, yeah, many opponents do get the better of me in the opening, but a uh, of those players who study openings, it's not extremely common to find one who can also find lots of tactics out of positions like this opponent can. So uh, I wanted to like steer clear of tactics, uh, but also not play overly cowardly here. So d3 is also super conservative. I was a bit surprised to see this. Um, last time we played, again, my opponent had played a very fierce attack right out of the opening and had cornered my pieces more or less. So I was a bit surprised to see. Like, knight f3, I get it. Bishop g2, I get it. But, um, and this is totally fine for white to play. It's very conservative. Um, so in this match, since I'm on board four, um, and teammates, I don't know, uh, they have some expectation of me to try to push a bit. Plus it's in my nature to try to push. Um, that's why I play D5 there. It's really, really not in my wheelhouse to play this position. Uh, if you've seen me try it in Blitz, you'll see. Usually I'm not playing Knight f6 from the get-go. Here I did play Knight f6 because I expected my opponent to play something much more aggressive. Uh, they didn't, so here we are. And here I'm having to figure out, okay, yes, I could like play symmetrically and we could have a game where I'm just going to lose my attention trying to pay it attention to it. Or I can try to push for something and make the game exciting and something that I'll pay better attention to. So here we are in this zone of something I've never played before. Um, yeah, c3 is okay. I kind of expected e4 by now or d4 by now. So uh, again, we're walking this tightrope of, like, I'm expecting my opponent to play something extremely sharp and aggressive at any moment, combined with this is not a position that I'm familiar with, and I'm, like, super nervous. Um, so I decided to develop my piece, which is sensible. It's difficult for the opponent to strike back against it. I mean, yes, they could play h3, and against this, I think I was preparing something like that. Um, I don't think I would have played bishop f5, and, like, this is a game. This is more or less white playing the position that last time we played, I was playing something like this and struggling to survive with it. So we've kind of reversed positions there, but anyway, uh, we get this position. I offer this exchange, and yeah, this is what I expected. Uh, they play ever since playing knight f1 here. The idea uh, that was conceived was just to drop the bishop back and try to apply pressure on this square. Um, you don't play a move like knight 
to E3 unless you got something in mind here, because that blocks your pawn. But what the opponent has in mind is, like, my bishop is not super comfortable. Uh, on the other hand, black does control space, so black is preferred in this position. But I don't think it's a large advantage, and again, like, I'm super nervous that I'll mess up something and this pawn structure is going to split at any moment, and then... You know, if they if the opponent successfully gets in d4 and is able to target my d pawn, that I start getting a bit nervous there. So to stop the opponent from playing d4, I play it myself. And yeah, what a fun, fun mess we've landed in. Um C takes d4 is possible. I didn't expect it. Um, yeah, I thought like we'd see anything else here. Uh, it's complicated. I mean, it's fine. Um, but like, I was looking at knight c4 or knight f1. I don't think knight c2 is so great. So... Yeah, I think this is fine for white. Yes, black does get pressure on the c3 pawn, but white gets pressure on the other diagonal. I don't like my position here. I was considering following with knight g4, trying to control the square, um, but I think I'm always one tempo behind. So... I don't know that this would have been so great. And here they still have the ability to take on d4, but it does activate my pieces more than it activates theirs. I don't know. So like knight c4 I think is possible. Um, I think even knight f1, like I was mentioning, is plausible. And Well, no, c-pawn's actually loose here, isn't it? So, yeah, C takes is just fine. Um, my opponent asked after the game, why don't... would this have been reasonable? Um, and I commented that I wasn't so comfortable with this position. Um, but a master nearby had commented that, you know, this is actually quite fine for black. Uh, black controls the open lines on the board. Yeah, the bishop is obscured by the pawn, but that's no big deal. Black has a ton of activity. And even if this pawn somehow drops, whether in this variation or in other variations, black's activity more than makes up for it was the idea. Um, I'm not completely totally sold on it, but I'm not a master either. Like, I like White's bishop being unobscured on the slog diagonal. I like for White that this d-pawn seems to be overextended and difficult to support. But, I don't know. Oh, but more than that, um, yes, I could remove the defender of the king, which is this knight. But I didn't see any attack that follows up on the king. And I thought that this was more to the point that um, since white's development felt to me slightly better than black's development, I wanted to cramp white's position. So I think even despite uh, what the master was suggesting, I think this is the better move. Yes, I, I think Sure, I could play the other variation, but I think this cramps white's position better than alternatives. Um, that said, maybe there's some trick to all this, and I don't know. Maybe this pawn is still, like, loose no matter what. I don't know. Because this knight on c6 is hard to use. 
it's going to be a long time before I can actively use this unless the D pawn gets liquidated and the D3 pawn gets exposed. Uh, does the actually, instead of CD4, well, yeah, what about, what about queen takes? Sure, this is active, but does black's activity more than make up for that? I don't think so. No, I don't believe in that either. So, I think, yeah, this is just not... I'm not seeing black pulling a win out of this. Uh, not that I can say that this is, like, winning for black either. It's not. Um, and so I kind of don't like my d4 move in the first place, but... Uh, like another potential idea was e5, and the more I looked at this, the more nervous I got about it. So, um, I was mainly nervous about this. Maybe there is something that black can do here to make it exciting, and I don't know, like d4, um. So variation one, if knight takes, pawn takes, and this is threatened. And this is also threatened. So that's a double attack. That's, uh, there's no pleasant way to meet this. So like white would have to save the knight somehow, and then this is just super loose. And I think that's better for black. So we're not going to see knight takes here. Not immediately. But if knight c4, then this bishop can drop back. I can preserve my bishop and have pressure on this point. And uh, white's rook doesn't control e4 unless the pawn's already on e4. But see how this is transposed. Well, I'm sorry. Only if I don't take it. And I think I do. So, yeah, that's not pleasant for white. Um, so what else can white try? I don't know. Um, maybe this is the way to go. Or maybe white six, no. Knight e4 gets cut down pretty quickly. Which kind of suggests that knight c4 is not super great either. Uh, I guess force black to make a decision. Maybe that's the way to go here. Black, oh, that's a not that's not an easy decision, is it? Um, if you make the pawn structure symmetric, you've twice blocked this bishop, and well, that's already blocked. Um, it's going to be difficult to use. If you take here, there's a pawn and a half-open file, but black also gets a half-open file, but it's hard to target the e-pawn. If knight takes... Knight takes is beautiful. It must be reasonable if it's that beautiful. Um, hmm. Weird. So, e5, knight g5, d4. Maybe d4 is just unreasonable here. The idea is to try to force this knight to move and then be able to preserve the bishop. Oh! Why not this? Um, this doesn't do much. That's why not. Like, white could still play this. White's fine. Black has no advantage here. This retreat's not worth it. Um, yeah, black just needs to continue development and believe that there will be an attack here eventually. Perhaps um, something like queen takes and knight off and then f5 to follow. So possibly something like that somehow um 
So that that kind of idea is why I didn't play e5 here, because I didn't want to see knight g5. Oh, my opponent after the game was thinking... No, they actually did ask about this. They were confused about which position in which they were asking. Uh, but yeah, this I had considered. Um, why didn't I like this? Oh, then I just play d4. And then I'm in a position where I'm not familiar with what's going on. And I have a strong hunch that my opponent understands this position and I don't. I don't know whether that's actually accurate, but from the last time we played, they studied tons of openings. So I wanted to do anything I could to try to break them out of their preparation. And d4 foots the bill here. d4 gets a unique position, so now we're in the swamp and we have to figure it out. So that's what I was thinking. Yeah, during post-game review with the opponent, I couldn't remember what my thought process was here, but now I do remember. I was trying to confuse my opponent, which is something I remarked after the game. Yeah, I was actively trying to confuse them, to, so I wasn't the only confused player, but there is a concrete example of it. Knight g2. So this, <laughs> this shows that we're both confused. Um, yeah. So my little gambit had paid off here. Uh, the G, you generally don't want to put a knight on G2. Because um, it's just very awkward to try to move it anywhere else. You can't really attack my king with the knight out here. It doesn't really do a good job defending any of the pawns or squares around those pawns. Like here we see this covers the square, the square, the square. Those are already covered. So unless you're planning on moving the pawns or something, this doesn't really, it's not a positive contributor. Um, so yeah, here, I take away this square. So neither the knight nor the bishop can use it. And so now I'm in the driver's seat. Um, I had expected knight g5. I think this is still confusing after knight g5. Yeah, I can... I don't know what I would have done. I was thinking about bishop g4... Then they kick it, and then I retreat again. I didn't like that. So I probably would have settled on this. Um, just so I get to keep my bishop. Oh, wait a sec. Wait a second. Knight g5 doesn't really threaten to exchange here. Yeah, both... So in post-game review, we mentioned, like how I had some threat on h2 somewhere. This is the moment where I'm threatening h2. Um, so this must have been what my opponent was planning until we see this very position after I've pushed e5. And then they back out of this, because they must have been planning this. They were trying to get my bishop. And so finally I offer it under this weird circumstance. Um, and now they don't want it anymore because I've got this massive attack going. Yes, I guess this could stop the knight advance, but then there's just holes everywhere. And you don't want to deal with that. So um, I'm not sure even how black would exploit this, but there's got to be something here. Uh, again, the knight on c6 is awkward. But you don't expect to get this. You don't expect these holes to just miraculously show up. So, um, oh, actually, so this instantly threatens a fork there. Yeah, even if they do for, figure out how to protect that, uh, you got stuff. There's lots of stuff here. So, 
Um, yeah, I don't know that this is... Well, yeah, if you could take that square, that'd be pretty cool. Um, pretty sure there'd be something around this point. So, anywho, um, so knight g5 would not be the greatest move here, even though that's, this is what they've been leading up to, right? So, ever since they played knight e3 threatening this thing with bishop h1, white's been trying to play this and get the bishop for knight exchange here. Anywho, so they... In this position, they play instead knight g5, which would be weird. They play e4. Um, this raises many, many questions. Should I take the pawn or not? <laughs> Again, I'm nervous. Again, I'm trying to force the opponent into some position that they've never seen before. And so with that in mind, trying to like make the opponent think I push or I take this. Trying to keep us in the swamp here. So we have knight takes. It's fine. Yeah, the knight could threaten infected. White's threatening uh, a triple attack on uh, this. So that's sad. <laughs> so I see this triple attack forthcoming and yeah, this in post game with our master um, I asked questions because I'm like okay, I push e4, yes it liquidates any initiative black has but I could not find a way that I was happy with this or the other rook. It doesn't. Don't think it matters. I just could not see a way that like black would get initiative here. Um. Whoa. Okay. Shit. <laughs> I missed this tactic. That would have been a nice tactic to spot during the game. The point being, now with the double um, the D file, this pawn's pinned. Uh, oh my god. Did we all miss that? That's amazing. Um, uh, I don't know. I still like white's latent potential on this diagonal. Yeah, black... I don't know. It's hard for me. Oh, the other thing I didn't, still didn't care for was this, where white still gets the bishop for knight exchange on an open board. So if I'm so displeased with this, so my plan was just exchange off and get an equal endgame, or maybe I have a very slight pull, but it's not great. Um... But, yeah, maybe, maybe this, well, I'm sorry, not this. Maybe after e4, uh, I needed to, like, find some guts here. Really hunker down and try to compute what the heck is going on after something like rook c8. Um, or queen d6, or I don't know. Uh, I couldn't easily spot something black should do here. The first move that came to mind was bishop g4. Uh, and then I resolved, well, white's just going to step out of the... Well, they can't. It's not easy to step out of this, is it? Um, I guess there's this move. And then this threatens queen b3. And white can, like, unwind this pretzel. Uh, thought it was fine. Again, I've played the King's Indian before. I've not played the other side of it. So, this is not 
easy for me. But it also raises the question, why bishop g4? So maybe bishop g4 is not the move either. Uh, I mean, the idea of bishop g4 is kind of reasonable to find some activity and try to pin white down, but knight h4 I think answers that. What black would love to do would be to attack this pawn. I started to calculate this and just got overwhelmed. Just there's a zillion variations here. And if I mess it up, my e pawn is an easier target than their d pawn if I mess it up. And white can always drop knight e1 to defend this and probably something else it's just this is not an easy position so i think i taking is reasonable but, but now white's got this triple attack threatened so where was my mistake then was f or is e5 really ridiculous here and maybe i should have just developed another piece uh, yes, <laughs> yes, e5 was ridiculous. Okay. Well, we've got that settled now. Yeah, they've given up control of the c2 square, so I should just bring the rook over. And I'm threatening this. I'm threatening to bring this up. Oh, not there. And like drop this on c2 and this over it's something black is the player with the pole in this position yes white has the latent potential of some variety somehow yeah they even have this move this is vexing me because now i'm having to judge is it okay for me to exchange my bishop? Actually, it's not. I don't like this. So the other thing I'd been looking at was knight d5. But the problem with knight d5 is that white threatens this. And then, like, what's black doing? Black's got a loose d-pawn that's just blocking everything. So that's no fun either. So, I mean, there's bishop takes knight, just kind of interesting. But then white gets initiative by activating c1 bishop. Is my strategic error before... Oh, right. Yeah, so my opponent had asked about, like, why not knight takes. I'm... Finally starting to see the light here. I still didn't care for this. How can I start to enjoy this position? What is good about Black's side of this? I don't like it. This, to me, for Black, this looks ridiculous. Um, I did ask, the master recommended something like this. I don't know if I had this just right, but, um, they mentioned how black has a pretty severe initiative here. Again, I don't know. Engines will say anything about any position. The knight on d4 is pretty nice. But I don't know that it's even worth the pawn to do this. I'm not buying it. I'm struggling with this. Like, I take white's side of this, even though it's miserable. I tend to grab pawns. But I play a lot of blitz, so... Grabbing pawns and then trying to hold on to it in an endgame. It's a challenge. I guess I like to challenge myself in that way. I don't know why. But, um, 
Yeah, I didn't didn't believe in knight takes here. Maybe d4. Maybe that's the mistake. Strategic error. I was considering queen c7. That way... No, I still can't do this. If I retreat like this, um, this is hanging. I can't... This wouldn't be smart. Yeah, I looked at that during the game. Maybe h6. We've already talked about h6, and I didn't like how d4 was possible here. Uh, I still don't like it. That's awful. Yeah, just inviting d4 is not smart. So, what the heck is going on in this position? Yeah, bishop h3 is not common. Um... Should black just play e5 here? No, because then the knight gets kicked and doesn't... It's not smart. So I think... So I considered queen c7, and I miscalculated bishop f4, e5, concluding that black couldn't play e5 there. But I think this is where I started to get confused about everything, because queen c7 is totally fine here. Um, I think white's best at this point is to push e4 like they've been threatening to do. Uh, but black can take it. Yeah, that's... I mean, if white plays something else, this is even worse for white. This is the best deal white's going to get, but... Uh, it's not that great of a deal. White... well, no. White's got the upper hand here. Queen c7 doesn't fight hard enough to try to get some initiative. Um, did we consider e5 here? During the game I briefly looked at it. I saw if knight e3 or just drop the bishop back to e6. And if knight g5, I just allow an exchange there. But I didn't know what I'd do. Yeah, I don't... Knight f one's really flexible. I didn't like this position. What does Engine San say about this? E5. Black for preference. I don't know. So that's Stockfish's suggestion. But... I don't know. So if I'm looking for ideas, this is an idea. Black's pushing here. It's not familiar territory to me. It looks risky, but where's the fun in playing the game without taking some risk? Instead, we get this variation where pawns and pieces just get liquidated. And risk is minimized, but my opponent was generous here and let me hang on to a pawn. I think think they were they just had this brain fart here i think they were considering that if queen d3 oh wait wait a second oh but yeah our master suggested queen f1 here and white's fine so this is i mean queen f1's not trivial to spot obviously i missed it um but say they played some other queen move like this or something. I think this is what they're concerned about. But, uh, yeah. 
We basically need something to hold that together, and queen d1 doesn't quite cut it. So I think this is the illusion that they were under that somehow my attack is just extremely strong here. Note that if this I can take here and then win an exchange. So, yeah, unless you spot queen f1 or some means of defending this, um, I get why maybe consider retreating here. Or would not consider allowing this variation and, like, drop the pawn instead. Um, yeah, if you consider just something like queen e2, maybe you're afraid of this. And then this check or something. Like, it's not unreasonable to have some natural fear. Um, but queen f1 holds it if you spot it. So, yeah, this uh, bishop g2 is an unforced error. It's spooky, but an unforced error. And now I'm up a pawn. Now I'm finally in the driver's seat. Uh, and just having flashbacks to our previous tournament game, where after much, much fighting, I had eventually got into the driver's seat in that game as well, but it was way more complicated tactically. This, uh, we just have an end game ahead of us here. And so we just develop our pieces. Uh, King F1... I did not spot. Um, I was looking at King H1. I forget what else I was looking at, but King F1 was resourceful. Here, I decide to cover these squares, and I just gamble that you know probably my pawn and knight are fine. Probably it's difficult for my opponent to remove the pawn on D3, and hopefully I could get some initiative while they're doing it. Uh, to my astonishment, my extremely aggressive play confused my opponent, and we traded off into this endgame, where uh, initially I had that extra pawn, and now we've converted the pawn into an exchange. So I just developed my pieces. I say just as if that's simple, but... Uh, I had noted my opponent was maybe threatening bishop b4 to hit the rook if I tried some tricky stuff on the d-file, so put this on a light square first. And they, uh, they sidestep the d-file. I claim it. And the reason I claim it is because I had spotted this tactic and noted that, you know... Even if somehow I had miscalculated this, and I was pretty sure I hadn't, and even when we hit this position, I looked at it again, and again, and again, and again, I just double-checked, like, am I reading this correctly? Because if I mess this up, that's really bad to lose the queen, but... No, I got this right, but I was figuring... My fallback variation here is I just move the queen away. We'll figure out something else, like queen e6 or queen c7. Or A lot of moves are still playable here if somehow I miscalculated this, but I had anticipated this tactic, which did materialize on the board, so lucky me. Um, now, the other thing is, even when I saw that this was possible, um, I had some time on the clock. I still considered, like, is this what I want to do? Do I want to exchange queens here and just go into an endgame? And mm, just at a very high level of thought, I had two competing ideas. One is, you know, maybe for once I could grab the initiative against this opponent who seems to, like, always be trying very hard to grab the initiative. Maybe there's somehow I could finally take that away from them. Um, so, like, you, you saw how they gave a pawn 
so they could keep the initiative. And then they gave an exchange so they could keep the initiative. And, you know, that's... <laughs> It's not, mm, it's hard to find peace of mind, like, when I'm under attack here. Like, if we go way back here, so, uh, when was, when was my first clue? So I played c5 and knight c6, they played c3. So this is offering me the initiative if I want it. And I'm like, well, uh, normally, yes, I do try to push for initiative, but I didn't think I'd be able to keep it here. So I was actually correct that like my opponent would force my hand. Um, they'd continue finding tactic after tactic after tactic in these positions, and I'd be forced to respond to all these tactical ideas because I don't have an attack strong enough to overwhelm the first move advantage. Um, so they make these positional concessions, but they're always threatening to move their pieces to active squares. And so if I just play really slack moves here, they're going to activate their pieces, and I'm just going to be playing passively for the rest of the game. So... I am forced to find active move after active move in a position that there's just so much complication and complexity in. Um, yeah, so playing actively is my opponent's style. It's also my style. And last time we played, it was one firestorm of a game. Lots and lots of tactics, and I hung in there by a thread, and eventually, in a complicated endgame, got a little bit of initiative going, but immediately gave it back. And so here, I was trying to make sure I always had the initiative if I could. But they gave up positional concessions, and then they gave up material just to keep ensuring they keep getting this initiative back. I'm like, you know, I... In this situation, what I was thinking is, okay, I could either trade into this end game where I'm better, or I could try to outcalculate my opponent, who I've, in both this game and previous experience, had a very, very difficult time trying to outcalculate. Um, and I just doubted my ability to play this middle game. Um, I think, uh, I guess the saving grace here is that this is not a good middle game to play. Like, yes, if we were to trade rooks, but not queens. If the queens stayed on, but one pair of rooks exchanged. Um, a rook doesn't fight that well in this bishop, knight, rook versus double bishop and knight combination. It's a difficult middle game for sure. Unless I have very tactical means to try to force it into an end game. So I don't think queen takes rook is the best move. I think black can play a middle game or they're constantly threatening to go into this endgame or that endgame or this endgame or that endgame. I think Black probably, by making lots of threats, can attack pretty wildly in this middle game. I could not bring myself to attack in this position, but I think the most interesting line is not exchanging the pieces like I did. I think Black has initiative, Everything of Black's except the knight on f6 is active. White's king is slightly exposed. I thought this... Like, this position is wonderful for Black. So it would make sense to avoid an endgame here. That said, the endgame is pretty good. I'm just saying, I think the middle game is even better. 
Um, but having said that, the thing that makes this endgame amazing is I think what transpired next here. Um, does White have any shot to make this complicated? Because, oh man, um, I was thinking White would take here. And I've not even calculated this. Uh, again, I was just spooked out of my mind of that potentially extremely messy middle game. Didn't want to think about that. I didn't want to think about this until I saw it on the board. So I was being a bit lazy. Um, but yeah, had my opponent taken the knight first? So there's two variations to consider. One is this exchange. And the other is rook takes. Um, well, I think... I think bishop takes can be ruled out, right? Because, well, no, bishop takes b7 drops the knight. So in this position... Oh, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, we could rule that out. Um, so rook takes d5. This is the only thing black can do in response. However, um, I don't know if white wants to exchange bishops here. I don't know if black can force a bishop exchange. <sighs> this is complicated. So... Black's better, but with this bishop still on the board, and Black's bishop's threatening a pawn, but that's not the end of the world. Unless I can spot some tactic for Black, to me this looks complicated. Like, if I were in White's shoes, I don't think I'd trade this, because Rook versus Knight seems pretty clearly better for um, Black there. But this, I think, could potentially be complicated. Um, Black will want to exchange this bishop for something. Oh, so with that in mind, you just play bishop d4. And white... <laughs> uh, white's eventually going to move the knight, or not move the knight. And either way, the bishop dominates these squares. So this is a sad position for white. Okay. Assuming I can spot bishop d4, find some other way to get one pair of minor pieces exchanged here. So, okay, bishop takes d5 is nothing special then, because it more or less transposes to what happened. Bishop takes d5 here stunned me. Uh... Yeah, I, like, huh. I think after they take this, it's just a matter of technique. And I demonstrated enough to get the job done, but um, I can see why is white you despair because black can just push all their pawns onto dark squares or something. Maybe not all of them. Maybe you don't push them all immediately. But uh, it's extremely difficult for white to muster any attack, any prolonged attack here. So, yeah, exchanging that builds as much initiative as you're going to get. But also what builds initiative is just using the king. Uh, white spikes knight c3. This forces white to make a decision. Do you want to move the king uh, to this side or that side? You have to pick a direction. And 
white chooses to keep the kings opposed to each other, which I thought was white's best play there. If white had moved the king over uh, to the other side, then I'd try to invade with uh, my king. Let me put that on the board. So if white tries to play something like this, um, yeah, we try to invade. Sure, white can defend. Oh, I'm sorry. This is not what I had in mind. Um, I had something more direct in mind. This, um, <laughs> which drops a pawn. <laughs> no. Oh, no. Oh, we saw that. Okay, you didn't see anything. So, F3 then. Um, yeah, so, I guess my immediate idea was not super great. But breaking the pawns up is fine here. You know, you could try to use the rook to attack, but... Well, actually, this this sucks. Oh my god. Wow, my endgame technique is nowhere near. Maybe there were tactics here to justify king d3. Or maybe I'm just playing extremely unconvincingly against it. But, yeah, get the rook to safety. And then, well, g5 still doesn't work, but... Something like this. The problem is white just takes here, and it's... Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. Um, it's forcing white to make a decision. I thought king f3 was best. I'm having second thoughts. Maybe rook e1 is the way for black to go? Even though it allows f3, if f3 eventually g4 is coming. Uh, yeah, no, this check sucks. What am I thinking? So, yeah, I'm not thinking clearly. This check is just awful. It gives away a tempo. Um... This may or may not be the best use of that tempo, but black has given a free tempo to white. And then to avoid tactical nonsense, I stick the rook on the other side of the board. It's just so I don't F this up. Um, so what I should be playing here is rook c1. Threatening rook c2. That's what I should be doing here. And yeah, white uh, could play a3, f3, whatever. Maybe f3 first. No. It all sucks. Like, this is the move. It's embarrassing that I missed this. After I moved, I saw this, but it's too late then. So, rook f1 sucks. Um, f3... Yeah, this is a good attempt to play actively in a lost position. Uh, so I just play a bunch of cowardly moves here. Again, instead of king e6, uh, rook c1 is definitely for choice here. Um, in any ensuing endgame... Yeah, white maybe be able to get away with a3 or a4 or something. And maybe there's going to be some tactics or something. Maybe I slip up somehow and end up exchanging too many pawns. But rook c1's the way to get initiative here. And it's just, again, embarrassing that I missed it. But let's get to the cool part, because there is a cool part here. So, force king g3 here. And, yeah, note that if knight b5, this knight's corralled. So, um, there's no protecting the knight and protecting this pawn. And I've been looking through and trying to find some way for this knight to jump out and cause other havoc, and just didn't spot anything severe here. 
maybe there is a shot after rook a1 with something like g5 or h5 or f5. I don't think so, but maybe. I think in this position I'd take here and like I'm able to collect enough pawns that it's not worth it for white. Even though there might be shots here somehow, but I don't think white can give up the A-pawn for nothing. So I think rook A1 seals the deal in that position. Um, again, if A4, this picks up the B-pawn. And if white tries to evacuate the knight, um, this is winning. So that's pretty straightforward. Hence, g5 here, uh, but we take the knight, which is kind of cool. Rook d1, note that if king g4, the king can't enter. Um, there's no stopping this. So white pushes h7, I stop the pawn, and that's that. Um, yeah, so here the king is too slow to invade. They can't support this in time. So uh, maybe there was some hallucination that the king... It initially looked like this king was going to support the pawn, but the trick here on king g4 is rather... Uh, or this king g4, rather than playing the rook back and allowing maybe complications, probably not, in fact, you wouldn't move the king. Well, you don't have an alternative to moving the king first, do you? Uh, let's take a look. So if you move something other than the king first, like this. Yeah, I could see an opponent. Maybe I could see myself messing this up in some circumstances. You could try to read out the pawn race and try to find some trick here somewhere. Um... But uh, the key is not that. The key is spotting this uh, rook d5. I thought this is what we're going to show on the board. And now pawn h5 doesn't work. Pawn f5 doesn't work. Note, this rook d5 is not available if you play the rook to e1. That could be hairy. <laughs> this could be pretty thorny. Um, I don't know. Is this lost? No, oh, black is still better. How? Rook e8. H5. Take. Take. Rook h8. Oh, white can't advance the king. Oh. Okay, so black still stands better here. If king g6 were available, this uh, gets a little spooky. Um, yeah, if white could somehow force the exchange of the rook for this pawn, then it comes down to whether black's king can like trebuchet the white king or something. But since king g6 is not available here, um, it doesn't matter. That's sharp stuff. Um, but yeah, rook d1 avoids all of that complication, and there's no shot here, right? Yeah, there's nothing white could do to try to complicate this. Initially, Stockfish was recommending f5 here, which I guess could maybe be confusing. Um, because now there's no rook d5 shot. But, uh, is rook d6? Well, okay, it doesn't matter. At this point, we're playing around. Yeah, rook d8's the way to handle this. And white can't support everything simultaneously. Um, I wonder if rook h1 is playable. Yeah, it's fine. Because you could play f6 here. <laughs> you could play rook g1 here. Um, 
yeah, that's cheeky. So all roads lead to Rome here. Um, but yeah. I thought I was making some illustrative point about why Rook D1 was better than Rook E1, but, you know, I guess it doesn't matter. Um, yeah, I thought we were going to see this position and then White resign, something like this, but... Um, but no, this didn't occur. We instead got this, and... Uh, well, actually, this wasn't part of the game. The game concluded after um, Rook H or Rook D8. Yeah, there was no need to make further moves here. So complicated game. Um, lots of emotions there. Lots of me just being extremely spooked by memories of the last time we played. Uh, but then this happened. And we finally entered uh, this position where I thought an end game could be produced, and we both agreed to play an end game as one where black's better. Um, yeah, so I wasn't huh. like I'm always the player that's trying to find some opportunity where it looks i don't know like i would take material over position in many cases i would take initiative over position and so i find myself on the reverse side of that coin here where i've got a static plus but no idea how to convert it and my opponent has many dynamic possibilities but just needs to find the time to execute any one of them. Um, yeah, I think if I'd not played knight e2, then this gets difficult. Does Stockfish agree that knight e2 is my idea here? Yeah. Okay, and then it's recommending bishop c3, rook a d8. Not sure I buy rook a d8. Well... Maybe, actually, yeah, that makes sense. I was planning to exchange the knight on c3, but, you know, maybe that doesn't matter. Yeah, rook a d8 activates the rook and makes it no longer a target. Exchanging the knight on c3 loses a tempo. In a position where my opponent's done everything thus far to try to... Well, not everything. Like, this is a strong, sensible setup for white. Very flexible. But here with knight f1, white's already conceding, like, a tempo and effect. Or not even a tempo, they're just conceding um, the first player edge. Black's able to play uh, e5. I didn't play it. But Stockfish recommends e5. I think it's pretty reasonable and it's still a really complex game thereafter but i think um it's fine so yeah mm -hmm. white played a pretty reasonable solid opening i don't understand why they got so spooked by all of this well other than the fact that like i'm <laughs> I've been on the other side of this position, or similar things. Uh, I know what it's like to flounder around looking for an idea. And so I'm not necessarily playing the strongest moves here. I'm trying to play the ones that'll get the strongest reactions. And knight g2 is one heck of a reaction. Um, it's not bad, but... Um, well, e5 sucked here. I, I needed to activate my pieces, and I just didn't do that. What would Stockfish play here? Bishop g4? Straight away? Why bishop g4? Hmm. 
this did briefly cross my mind because I saw Knight F4 coming and I wanted to prepare for it. But I thought Knight F4 would happen anyway than H3. Maybe it's fine. Maybe I've got Queen D6 or something. So, yeah, I think just forcing my opponent to come up with original ideas was my aim this game. Trying to get them in a position they've never seen before. And, yeah, I definitely succeeded at getting us both a position we'd never seen. They would have had to spot Queen F1, they missed it. And then I'm finally in the driver's seat here and... Yeah, knight d4 is definitely the way to go. Um, which, is bishop d2 bad? Because um, I didn't expect it. I didn't know what to expect, but having seen it, like, I was ex half expecting the bishop to find some other square to go to, like b2 or a3. I didn't... The bishop can blockade the pawn, but also knights can hit a bishop in front of a pawn. Um, yeah, so I I was looking at this during the game. I'm not as accurate as Stockfish by any means. How much of this variation do I want to take credit for here? Like queen a4, rook d8. I was thinking rook c8. Maybe rook d8's better. And they block, and then rook e8. So I was thinking put the rooks on c8 and d8, or c8 and e8. Uh, Stockfish recommends the rook on the d-file, which I guess threatens to push the pawn, so that forces bishop d2. Yeah. Maybe I eventually would have found this. It would have been very hard to figure out all these nuances. Because I wanted to put my rook on c2, but that's taken, or c4, but that's blocked, but c3 is also claimed. And since I couldn't put the rook on any of these squares here, then I couldn't, like, for likewise, I couldn't get the other rook on the e-file. So maybe I would have come up with rook d8, either rook there, just out of desperation. It would have been okay, but my queen makes kind of a target on a wide-open board. And so from that perspective, like, I thought white would somehow pull a um, big initiative here. Uh, is d2... Oh, what? Why did Stockfish recommend this queen a4 if there's this tactic? Is this not real? How is this not a tactic here? Why did Stockfish recommend Queen A4? Why did I think about this during the game when this seems like... What's going on? Bishop takes, Queen takes, Rook AD1. Queen takes, Pawn, Knight C4. Wow. Uh-huh. White sacrifices a bishop for a pawn and then gives the pawn and then hits the queen and then takes here to get the pawn back, but not really. Uh, hits the queen again. <laughs> That's a queen trap. Did you check that out? But the queen trap runs into a knight fork. So, to, I mean, you could prevent the knight fork, or you could allow it. Um, how does this play? Okay. So, anyway, the black's queen gets trapped in the line. And so that's why Stockfish is able to recommend this uh, for white, this queen a4. Because white's position is already difficult, but um, yeah, this fork doesn't isn't anything extra for white to worry about. 
Um, and I miss... Obviously, I miss D2. I don't know what it is. Like, somehow I have this strong preference for peace activity and a belief that it just, like, works all the time. But this... This finesse to variation with Queen A4 is only possible thanks to this uh, Queen Trap. Which, uh, it's not super easy to spot. And black still stands better after the Queen Trap, but... Um, yeah, funnily enough, why don't you take the Queen? I guess black gets two rooks for the queen in the night. Um, so, there's that. Black's got two rooks for a queen here. Um, but instead, Stockfish recommends this position. Where, what's... Actually, I'm not sure I evaluated this. Black's queen is still trapped. Black's still okay with their queen being trapped because they get a passed pawn. Which looks enormous. I'm not sure what I played this. Well, if you play the other rook, you drop this pawn. Oh my gosh. Look at this ridiculous chain of tactics. So, Black cannot save all three pieces simultaneously. That's insane. And rook d1 doesn't fix anything because there's still two pieces and you can't move one to protect the other. So if you spot this monstrous variation, then you can play queen a4 like I was expecting during the game. Um, but I didn't spot half of that. That's an awesome series of tactics. And yeah, this is the bailout variation for black where they don't calculate everything just as to the finesse that Stockfish does. Um, actually, wait, it's not black bailing out here. It's white taking instead of taking d5. So here and this um, black is not Black has both rooks and the bishop here. Whereas in this position, black's going to give the bishop, so black doesn't have a bishop for knight advantage for very long in this position. Else, uh, they keep black could keep the bishop for knight advantage here. Um, it is possible. Uh, but queen and knight have synergy in a way that two rooks and bishop don't exactly have synergy. So, yeah, um, I agree with Stockfish. Easier said than, like, challenging Stockfish on its evaluation can be hard. So it's obviously easier to just say, oh yeah, I agree with this extremely strong program, but no, like, given a choice between this position and that position, I would take this one for black out of those two. Um, yeah, I believe the rook pair offers possibilities of ganging up on the a2 pawn. It won't be easy, but um, this position's even harder. Where white's constantly going to threaten to try to win a rook for a knight. And there's it's just not easy. Um, rather, because... Pawns are symmetric on both sides of the board. This favors knight over bishop. So this variation... Um, wait, but Stockfish recommended this one. And I was trying to justify why this one's better for black than this one. Um, so I guess take what I said and reverse it. Black has an extra pawn. And this extra pawn overcomes whatever other considerations exist in this position. Black's just up the pawn and can get some initiative with that. Whereas here, pawns are symmetric. 
So, yeah, Queen A4 is White's strongest move. Uh, obviously, if you have to spot this super long, complicated variation to play that, instead White played Bishop D2. And here I just put the pedal on the gas for a bit and drop the knight in. Uh, cause, uh, yeah, I had been planning that if White was going to push here... No, I can't play knight e2 right away, because rook takes and... Well, actually I could. My queen's defended, I miscalculated that. Somehow I phantomed that my rook was on d8, so this would be fine. But actually this is fine because my knight supports the queen. Um, not sure what I was thinking. I think what I was considering was not so much the knight supporting the queen, but a different variation, where white puts the king away. I develop my rook, and uh, this move I was looking at, I think. No, that wasn't it. That was not it. Um, hmm. It wasn't king h1. Because I was debating which rook do I move first. I think it was this rook c1 I was looking at. Um, but no, that walks straight into the fork. That wouldn't be it either. <sighs> How... How was I considering this? Somehow I was thinking bishop b4 was going to be played and countered by knight e2. With the idea that if this were here, then my rook would already be on d8. Which is not accurate. I don't know, I was hallucinating here. It's, I guess, the only conclusion I can draw. Um... Or maybe this is what I was looking at. And then looking at bishop b4 and trying to figure out, like, can I move the knight or the rook here? That was something. I don't know. Maybe it wasn't rook a d8. Maybe it was rook f d8. Bishop a5, knight c2 or something. None of this makes any sense. Whatever I was looking at during the game, um, whatever variation, was not correct. It's good that I picked this. Uh, Stockfish recommended a different move. It recommended rook f e8. And then knight e2. So this is perfectly sensible and sidesteps bishop b4. Um, yeah, if this bishop moves out knight e2, that's fine. That's actually that's brilliant because now if you're threatening to exchange rooks and variations, it gives more things for white to think about. Anywho, this, um, once, does Stockfish disagree with rook f8? No, Stockfish is fine with my move. So, yeah, at this point, um, it's difficult to see how white can activate their pieces. Um, I was debating between do they play bishop c3 or rook d1? If they played rook d1, I had intended this, which transposes incidentally. Um, is there a third option here? No, oh, bishop c3 is the best thing. And is there another option after rook d1? No. Oh. Okay. So all it took for me to get my head on straight was um, approach the end game. Um, I guess we could take 
Stockfish's evaluation of a few other positions here too. I guess knight d5. Okay, b6 is sensible. I don't know if knight d5 is any worse though. Yeah, knight d5 is fine. And yeah, I was surprised to see so many pieces liquidate so quickly here. Um, Bishop takes his Stockfish's move. Okay, no, it changes. Stockfish is equally pessimistic about everything here, as it should be. But, um, yeah, the knight just doesn't afford enough possibilities. Oh, wow. This I did not expect. Maybe with my king on f6, this move makes more sense. Or well, on g7, my king, this makes more sense than with my king elsewhere. So let's say we check the knight blocks, and then the rook goes over to the... No, that's not it. Why is knight e3 not happen after rook e5? Isn't knight e3 really combative in some sense here? So let's say we throw this in. Why not knight e3? Okay, we backtrack the rook a bit. And white approaches. I don't believe in a3. Oh, unless too many things are hanging here. Okay, yeah, I guess too many things are hanging. You have to get the pawns on different ranks so the rook fork doesn't end the game. Uh, whatever. So Stockfish was recommending this, and you see how... The evaluation hasn't changed much. My king f6 is just fine. <laughs> yeah, no, Stockfish will realize that king f6 is just as good as anything else here. Uh, knight c3 makes sense. I did debate dropping the rook back. And then I was extremely impressed by my rook e5, and then later was kind of regretting it. Um, I think rook e5 is just as good as anything else here. Stockfish would prefer to keep the king on opposite sides of the board. I don't know. Is this really so bad? <laughs> king g7. No, that's ridiculous. King g7 is ridiculous here. You'd have to come up with something really creative to support playing that. Stockfish is trying to pick off one of these edge pawns without trading too many pawns. Um, no, Ricky one's got to be fine. Yeah, see? Stockfish is just kind of losing its mind here. Uh, yeah, I would push one of these because I'd be anxious about this position. I think a4 does make sense because you're trying to liquidate pawns and need to push as many as you can to try to make that liquidation happen. Uh, King f4 doesn't lose anything. King g7 I actually agree with here, having played the game and seen the variations that actually did result. King g7's fine. Rook c1's better. And the idea with rook c1 is that you want to anchor white's pieces. This is the position you're aiming for and dreaming of. And then break this apart. Yeah. I spotted this too late during the game. I started having these ideas after I played rook f1 and bungled it. Which, I mean, Stockfish would retreat and willingly play back into the same damn thing. I think human players would try not to do that. <laughs> King g7 again. I mean... Yeah, Narik c1, as I commented right not too long ago, it's the way to go here. Um, White can't do anything. Yeah, you could push a4 or something, but it's no good. Uh, these pawns are going to hang, and the pawns are supporting the knight, so the knight has to move. Otherwise, the b-pawn becomes an enormous target. 
Oh, I'm sorry. I stand correct. So, like, while human players would play F3 and transpose back into this nightmare, um, and, um, yeah, human players would avoid this. Stockfish is correct that this puts up the best fight for white. It's a losing fight. There's no saving it. But F3, Rook C1 is even worse. Where, yeah, you could check and, you know, stuff can happen, but... Um, oh, wow, really? That's not complicated. I thought there would be something complicated here. Because if you play this, can't Black just play Rook C2? Is this not complicated? <laughs> uh, can we take the B-pawn? Isn't this easily winning? Yeah. I guess it's a matter of a depth cap on the engine, but um, Rook takes B2 is just easily winning here. Because white can't collect both of these pawns without giving up the knight. So that said, um, this knight c3 is a bit ridiculous. And since knight c3 is a bit ridiculous, the knight d5 in the first place is questionable. I was looking at knight e4 rather than knight d5. I guess here black does drop back. And this is the stuff that... Is this sort of thing that I didn't want to... I wanted my rook on f1 so I didn't have to calculate any of this. Um, there are things to calculate here, but it all favors black. Uh, surely they push a pawn, right? Yeah. Stockfish recommends this. Black saves their pawn. And there's nothing white can do here. Uh, the white wants to trade all the pawns, but it's just too slow to actually pull it off. Uh, we'll get similar positions to what happened during the game. Now, if white could pick off the B pawn, that'd be a different matter. Um, it feels like white can't protect the king's side and pick off the B pawn. Um, yeah, there's fighting to be done here, but... Wait, can't you just push b5? <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, we're... Um, yeah, we're pushing this. Uh, okay. So white picks off a pawn, black picks off multiple pawns, and this is over. So, in summary, um, knight e4 is probably the most combative move here, but even this doesn't lead to anything. Um, yeah, there's a variety of ways black can win this here. I don't know why I'm showing this off. Other than to say black can force the issue with rook c1, and there's just not a whole lot here. Um, yeah, knight d6 is nothing to fear. Even rook c2, like, straight up forces things. And there's no need to look further than that. Um, rook c2 is decisive. So, since black has all of this, h6 is cowardly. Um... Yeah, Black should just be playing Rook C1 and winning the end game. Anywho, I played King E6 because I did. <laughs> I was afraid of messing up the end game. And yeah, again, Rook H1, another cowardly move. King E5, finally showing some guts. Um, perhaps a bit too much bravado, but whatever. Uh, yeah, we looked at this variation and saw Black's winning here. So G5 is 
as good as anything else you're going to find, but, well, no, it's not. This just instantly wins for black. So g5 liquidates. Um, yeah, if white wants to fight on, knight b5 is a way to fight on here, but it's a lost battle. Uh, is there any other trick in this position? Rook a4, a3, knight b5. Oh, yeah, no, that doesn't cut it either. Yeah, so rook a3 is just decisive on the spot. Um, so, consequently, yeah, there's, oh, so this means, uh, I can understand why they'd play g5, but f4 and, if f4 were intended to be followed by knight b5, knight b5 is no saving grace here. So, does Stockfish recommend f4? Or is there some other move here? Knight e4? Yeah. Knight e4 prolongs the battle because I missed rook c1. Knight e2, sure. Any move, like, prolongs the battle here. f4 almost cuts it, but not quite. So, we were able to win with some flashy moves. I was proud of this, and now Stockfish is tearing apart what I thought I knew. Um, I was impressed, but shows what I know, right? I need to be a bit more modest, and I mean, h6 is as modest as you can get here. It's either a high-class waiting move, preventing knight g5, or it's just stupid because, like, the whole time I had rook c1, rook c2, and I just repeatedly missed it. Um, when did I have rook c1? Here. As soon as white's king marches up the board. Uh, I was afraid I was going to drop these to some knight fork and things would get messy, or that white would push the queen side pawns and something I missed. Or drop the rook to some stupid fork. Like, if you're not paying attention, rook f2 just hangs the rook, which would kind of suck. So we barely avoided rook f2 here. Yeah, this is a way to get back into chess, over the board chess. Um, not sure how many games I'm going to be playing this year. I'll try to play some games, uh, learn things from them. Um, I guess one thing to learn from this is, like, during the game I was thinking, do I want to play a symmetric thing, or what do I want to play against this system? Do I have a preference? Because this is not something I see every day. And I've often wondered both the white side and the black side of this. Maybe I need to play this. But this seeds space. And against strong opponents, they just play d5, c5, and they'd be comfortable doing it. This is not my comfort zone. Um, I need to practice this, don't I? Well, then there's this to worry about, too. Like, so I was debating, do I go into that? Do I play this here? Do I play knight c6 instead, but then they play d4 anyway? Do I play d6 here, threatening e5, but then they... No, I don't. Unless, no, that's not worth it. Now, d5 is the move here. This is the principled play. Uh, yeah, other things are a bit cowardly, but I need to be, like, willing to play this. Stockfish hate this. It's even. Oh, bishop f5. That's interesting. Given how much <laughs> disdain I have for the London system, I'm amused that I would actually favor that here. Yeah, bishop f5 looks perfectly sensible against this kind of development. Which I guess says that if an opponent plays the London system, don't be in keto against it, because the reverse is something that looks extremely natural. Maybe I need to study, like, what to play against the London. It couldn't hurt. 
I did read Soltis's book, but I've forgotten it, so I could read it again or study something better. Um, people say there's multiple good ways to play against the London system, and it's true. I just need to, like, study openings. Uh, or, if I'm not going to study openings, be willing to play stuff like this. And uh, I play d5 here, or black's got space. I didn't like this. Maybe knight bd7's fine. I don't know. I'll have to figure out what even it is that I'm trying to figure out here. And then figure out after that question what's the answer or what's a suitable answer to the question. But anyway, um, yeah, this is a good introduction to this year's season. Hopefully, if I play more, um, I'll play better. We'll see. It was a good game throughout. I'm just kind of kicking myself for missing both number of um, candidate moves and not evaluating things properly and missing tactical variations just kicking myself for all of that here but yep yeah, uh, each game's learning experience and hopefully i can get over it so thanks for watching have a good day